good. Y'all, y'all know what this weekend is, right? Come, uh, somebody said it. I heard Gavin. It's Father's Day. Come on. God is good. I'm going to tell y'all, it still ain't hit me yet. It still ain't hit me, but I give God praise for this, for this time, this season, because the Lord is showing himself mighty. God is so good. Um, you know, it being Father's Day weekend, I want to allow us, but especially the men of this house, to honor the Father that the Lord has set before us. And so, while the pastor, the prophet is sitting here, I want to call the brothers up, build them in. If y'all will come up, yeah, come on, absolutely. And um, actually, Kenyatta, Kenyatta, would you grab those mics there? Thank you, sir. And we want to press into this because by faith we know this season that we are getting to know the Father like never before. You know, learning the Son, Jesus Christ, it's, it's one vein, you see. It's a vein to know. And we know that the scriptures say that if you've seen him, you've seen the Father. You see, but even in them being one and the same, there's still very individual attributes, very specific attributes about them all, the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, and God the Father. And the Lord has just been dealing with us mightily and understanding who he is. Him showing up and us learning how to operate as his child, okay? And so much of that we have learned through the man of God of this house, Pastor Moses. And so, come on, let's celebrate him again. And um, I just, hallelujah. I want to allow whoever has the mic first, okay, praise God, and we'll pass that around. The brothers here, the sons here, Pastor, uh, just want to take a couple minutes each to just honor you and what you have done and how you've been an impact to our life. So without further ado, fellas, you can go ahead and take it away. How we doing today, y'all? With us, with us honoring Pastor Moses, um, I have to start. He, he knows how I'm probably going to start. Him and Rosemary. So Pastor Moses and Sister Rosemary actually did our, uh, our marriage counseling, my wife Kayla and I. And um, when I tell you, interesting enough, he's, I, I think I've only told this to you. Um, I had reached out to my childhood pastor to do our counseling and never got a call back. Right. So I was like, that's weird. I was like, all right, something's going on here. So first question I asked Pastor Moses, Sister Rosemary, they're like, we got y'all. Come to the house. I'm like, come to, oh, y'all want us to come to your house? Now, mind you, we had probably only known them like a month or two. So I'm like, wow, they're just taking us in. I'm like, this is major. So we end up going through the counseling. Awesome experience. Brought us closer together and brought us closer with you guys and brought us to Communion House. So, so God is good. So that was such a, that was such a blessing and we will always be forever grateful for, for everything you bring to us spiritually and just for the great people that you are and the great man of God you are. Hallelujah. So thank you, man. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, everybody. brother passed away on um, March 3rd of this year in a car accident. And um, me and my wife, we were moving into our new house at the same time. And I fell into a deep, deep depression. I didn't even want to get off the couch. And then suddenly, um, suddenly the phone rang. And I looked up. And it was Pastor Moses. He called and he prayed for me. And um, it, helped, it helped heal me that day. And I was able to get up and press forward. The next month, my father passed away. Pastor Moses and his wife drove all the way from Sawana down to, um, to the funeral. And they, they, helped, they helped lift me up as well. So Pastor Moses, not only are you a hero of the word, but you are a doer of the word. You, you are a living witness to the Holy Spirit. And I just want to thank you. And thank you. Happy Father's Day. Pastor Moses, um, I just as, as Alan called you, Baba. Uh, <laughs> I, I understand now. You are you are a true 
example of what a spiritual father should do, um, both in your walk, uh, as far as being a husband, a father, um, and, and like I, I say it all the time, um, I'm used to being a leader. I was always team captain. So for me to follow anybody was gonna have to be somebody who was true to what they were doing. And I just wanna say, you have raised the bar. And the, the way you, you make us press in, you don't, you don't ask, you make us press in to the presence of God. You don't settle for uh, halfway or just surface dwelling. So I just wanna say thank you for uh, being the man, the prophet of God that you are, sir, and all your stringent, stringent uh, protocols that you implement upon the body. Hallelujah. Thank you, brother. Bless the Lord. Uh, I guess it's been about maybe five years now over here at Influencers. I'm going to be straight up honest. The day that I went at Influencers, I didn't even want to go. My, uh, <laughs> My daughter's mom just trying to drag me there, and I'm just like, you know what? I'm going to get her to shut up, so I'm going to just go. And then at the time, I remember I met him, and the server was okay, so I met him or whatever, and he seemed like a nice guy. And then I think uh, shortly after that, I had to go do some training, and like, I actually went to MP school for like a month, and then I came back. Then I had to go to JRLTC in Fort Polk, so I was gone for a while. So by the time I had got back or whatever, I heard you weren't there anymore. And so about a few months later, Communion Health started and then I've been here ever since. So I just thank you for being the blessing in my life. You're still with Hallelujah. me through some of the worst storms in my life and I just appreciate you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Um, I came to Communion House in September of 2020. But what I want to tell you, say to you, Pastor Moses, is that you, you raised the bar. I, I came from a solid ministry, but when coming to Communion House to see, during that time, to see you be true, I'm not going to say true to, to yourself, but true to the Holy Spirit, true to the Word of God, and, and just like others have said, to see you model the Word the way you do, you can't help but to grow in, grow in this ministry. But not only that, you know, I somewhat call myself a student of the word, but you have taken me to levels that is like, wow, Lord. But, and, and so I really want to appreciate you and tell you that you are an example of a real man of God, a prophet. And, and I, I truly appreciate that. And as I told you before, I love you. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise the Lord. I was um, in the hospital, in the emergency room, and when the nurse was trying to triage me to tell me what may or may not be my problem, I told her my problem was that I needed a leader, I needed God, I needed a man of God in my life. And she gave me communion house. She had been here and known Pastor Moses. And I went on YouTube and I followed him for over a year in the state of Ohio. Uh, your leadership has kept me. I just, I'm, I'm just so happy to be in this ministry where I'm learning. The example is real. The Holy Spirit is, is, uh, is taught and uh, explained. I mean, there's, there's no, nothing I can't get here. And I need praise God. I love you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Pastor <laughs> Moses. No no coincidence that we're here tonight it's no coincidence and to you and um pastor rosemary i guess the the thing that i can say is i look at alan and i've been knowing alan ever since he was about eight years old and when i look at alan and i think about him 
and I think about the times we've been together and I think about his life and where he is today is your impression on him and and that's the true of a man of God because Al is not going to follow anybody if it ain't true he's not going to follow I'm telling you he's he, he going to get out real quick you know and so when he talked to us about communion house and he talks to us about Pastor Moses and his relationship his fatherly relationship spiritual fatherly relationship with Pastor Moses that's 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 it that's it that's the impression that that you made upon him deep deep impression and so we're thankful for you and your ministry and your life experience and example to, to our son. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Hallelujah. you, Pastor Rosemary. You too, Pastor Rosemary. Okay. Hallelujah. And while the brothers are here, God is good. The scriptures say, believe his prophets and prosper. Since we have... Um, Since we have received this couple, my wife and I have prospered. You see? And uh, we know that the work begins deep down. And we have been seeing now those things manifest plainly. You see? And so I want to encourage you all in that. That flesh and blood cannot reveal this to you but your father in heaven my declaration over you tonight is that you receive a fresh revelation God is good <laughs> you know this is fertile ground <laughs> come on I'm speaking by the spirit and I'm speaking literally so prophet the brothers here, even some that have not been able to make it, our brother Antoine, brother John, um, they have sent tokens as well because they, they had conflicting schedules. That's okay. But we have come together by faith to sow a seed in your hand. And we know by faith that this shall be multiplied and that with it in your hand, knowing that by faith that by the word that the Lord gives you we shall be blessed and so let's honor the man of God here hallelujah God is good let's celebrate let's celebrate hallelujah And as you get that hug, fellas, you can make your way back to your seats. God is good. Hallelujah. We might as well stay um, standing. Let's stay standing because we have an on-time word from the man of God here in this time of honoring. Let us welcome Yet again, the prophet, the apostle, Pastor Moses Anderson. Hallelujah. God is good. Thank you, Alan. God is good. Praise the Lord. Thank you, everybody. Let's be seated. God is good. Oh, look at Sammy. Good to see you, man. How you been? God is good. All righty. So, um, wow, may we not replace our Bible with our coffee? Because I, I put my Bible where my coffee goes. God is good. All righty. Um, I just want to begin by saying a big thank you to everybody and especially the man, the builder man, the communion house guys. Thank you so very much. And um, excuse me. The Bible says that God rewards that which is done in secret. He rewards it openly. You see, thank God for the envelope that I haven't opened, but gifts started pouring in even since yesterday. You see, and so I just want to say big thank you to the man who made the contribution 
and also for um, going above and beyond. You know, I, I told my wife, I said, I needed to show you something because I, I was out of the house when, when I received uh, one of the very first gifts that came in uh, into my bank. And I'm like, wow, this has never happened. N not even on my birthday or Father's Day um, have I experienced such a show of love that a group of men will come together and say, we just want to, you know, we just want to bless you and this is how we're going to do it. And so I told my wife, I said, um, let me get home because I can't just tell you on the phone what just happened. And so I got home, I logged in and I showed my wife, I said, you see that we just came in, read the memo and it says happy Father's Day. And for all of those involved, everyone who made that sacrifice and expressed such generosity toward me, I am humbled, I appreciate it very greatly. God bless you and you shall increase abundantly in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. And I just, uh, I thought I would let you guys know that that, that, was, uh, that was the first in that magnitude. So y'all can give yourselves a pat on the back because, I mean, yeah. When I, when I saw it, I called Alan and I was screaming. I told Alan, I said, it's not just revelation that gets me excited. Things like this, just, just like this get me excited too. God is good. Alrighty. And um, Emmanuel, I like the way that I'm sounding, but can I sound a little louder? Maybe just a little bit, or maybe I can just hear myself a little more. That would help me greatly. Thank you, thank you, thank you so very much. Uh, sound is a very tricky thing. And so when you find people that are gifted in that area, I mean, you cherish them. You see, I can't even tell you how many times I've, you know, hugged Emmanuel or, you know, given him, him a high five. Uh, and that's because, man, I just want the guy to know that I love what he does with the sound. So God bless you, Emmanuel. God bless you real good. And for the times that he's not here and Bennett gets to do the sound, I mean... He does great too, you know, very multi-talented fellow. I appreciate you guys greatly. So we're going to begin today with a verse of scripture that the Lord inseminated in my heart. And that is in the book of Joel chapter 2. I know some people call it Joel, but I like to call it Joel because he emphasizes the name of God in that term, Joel. So let's go to the book of Joel, everybody. And um, we're just going to go right to chapter 2. And many of us are familiar with it because New Testament apostles and even the Lord Jesus Christ did quote uh, the prophet Joel. And today we begin our reading from chapter, I mean, verse 17 of Joel chapter 2. I want to give you guys a little preamble before we read of some of the things to expect. Um, it has a couple of things that have been brought to my attention lately in the realm of the spirit. And one of them is that we need to be aware. Remember last week when I was here, I spoke to us about a meeting of the angels that I was privileged to be a part of and what they talked about, the lamentation of their heart was that we have such a privilege that we underutilize. We have such a privilege of having them at our beck and call, so to speak, and yet not making the most of it. The Bible says that the Lord God himself has given his angels charge over us to pay attention to us so much so that we're not even allowed to stumble upon the smallest of stones. That's what the Bible says, that God has given his angels charge over us, lest we dash our foot against a stone. So if it so happens that you stumble, God will summon the angels and ask them to give an account of what happened. And I'm talking about angels who were present when God was creating the trees. Remember the Bible says that when the Lord was laying out his creation, the angels were applauding him. So these angels are not small boys and girls. These angels are the ancient ones who have been and who have power so enormous that they can always fulfill whatever assignment God gives to them. When Satan started to cause trouble in heaven, Lucifer to be precise, you know, because we come from different backgrounds and sometimes when you just use the word Satan, some people don't know what you're talking about because the word Satan itself just means the adversary, okay? And I've taken a cue from the apostle John when John was given a revelation that involved Lucifer as Satan, to be precise, he had to break it down so that those coming after 
who would read his revelation will know the particular adversary that he was talking about. There was a time that Peter started to oppose Jesus and Jesus called Peter Satan. And so when I say Satan, this time around, I want you to know that I'm talking about Lucifer when he started to cause trouble in heaven and his ambition constituted an opposition to the glory and disposition of the Almighty God. God was not ruffled where he was. God was not having sleepless nights. He wasn't worried. He just told Michael, please take care of this. Now we're talking about one archangel who's been able to gain command of a third of all the angels in heaven. It was one guy, but he had managed to gain the loyalty of a third of the angels in heaven. Now there, there were, at the time, already other archangels. And so it wasn't like Michael was commanding all of the two-thirds remaining, so to speak. God said to Michael, go and take care of Lucifer. Now, I want you to think about it for a minute. And the Bible says Michael got up and he drove them out. We have no record of Michael going on a campaign, pleading with the other two-thirds, saying to them, oh, y'all see what just happened? Uh, we need help. I need to rally support. No, the Bible says he got up and he drove out Lucifer and a third of the angels. One dude. With an interesting name because his name is who is like God. And so basically God made him so powerful so that every time that angel is on the move, we are reminded that there is nobody like God. And so these angels, as powerful as they are, God assigned them to look out for you and to look after you. And that's why the Bible says he has given his angels as ministering spirits. The word to minister means to serve. He has given all of these things, all of, all of such privilege has he bestowed upon you. And I found the angels saying, they are not even paying attention to us. We are messengers who come with a word from the heart of the Heavenly Father and yet they are not paying attention. So that was last week. And this week, one of the things that has also been brought to my attention is that we do not even understand that in the midst of the darkness that the world is experiencing is the abundance of light that is made available to the believer. Many of us, we choose to focus on the darkness and not on the light. What did I say to us on Tuesday? That we have come to the age of revelation. We have come truly to the apocalypse. You know, when we think about the apocalypse, Hollywood's made us to think that apocalypse means the appearance of zombies. You know, sc scarcity of food, bad, bad govern governance, war, oppression. We think about all of the evil Whereas the word apocalypse itself just means the exposition or the revelation. Apocalypse means the abundance of light. Earlier on, Alan was here and he read to us uh, from the account of the Exodus when the Lord's presence became darkness to the Egyptians and light to the Israelites. And so when we see the spate of darkness that is gone into the world, we should not focus on the confusion. We should focus on the clarification. You see, we think that the world is confused. People no longer know the distinction between genders anymore. We no longer can tell who is for us and who is against us. We elected this dude into office and he's supposed to be doing this. Why is he doing that? We complain and we focus on the darkness but the reality of it is the darkness is not for you. The darkness is for the ones who have decided to live in opposition to God. But those of us who have chosen to remain on the side of truth, those of us who have chosen to remain under the command of the Lord Jesus Christ are experiencing the most abundance most abundant revelation and we are experiencing the most clarity that we have ever experienced. Yes, yes. Amen. That's right. But if we're not careful, we're not going to enjoy it. I tell people, and I've been saying this for about two years plus, 
that I have never seen the heavens this open. You read scriptures that used to mean absolutely nothing to you. And when you read them now, it's almost as if God is sitting across the table and he's telling you exactly what he meant when he inspired Isaiah to write that. You understand what I mean? We look at the names of people in scripture now and we're like, wait a minute, how come I never knew that his name means that? How come I never knew that that was for me? We used to think Cyrus was some kind of mythical figure. But now when we read about Cyrus, we see that Cyrus is the church. Everything that was said about Cyrus was said about the church. You read things like that and it just blows your mind. Where were those revelations seven years ago? So I want to encourage you, choose to behold the light. In the beginning, the Bible says God saw that it was darkness upon the face of the deep. He came and there was darkness upon the face of the deep. And he said, let there be light and there was light. And what followed that? The Bible says God saw that the light was good. Many of us, we can see that the darkness is bad. And that is what is in our speech. We keep complaining. We keep comparing. We keep encouraging the promotion of the confusion when we are supposed to see that the light is good. We have to be intentional because when this was brought to my attention, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I uh, was brought into this conversation of the angels, of what the heart of your heavenly father is saying via the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you're wondering how all of that works, Jesus says that I will send to you, that the father will send to you another comforter. One that is of the same kind. He used the expression alos parakletos, which means another one of the same kind who is going to be God with you, is going to be by your side. The Holy Spirit is the true fulfillment of Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus came to make a sacrifice so that the heavens will open and for us to be able to receive the Holy Spirit who is God with us, our seal unto the day of redemption. However, even though the Holy Spirit is the only one that knows the heart of the Father, Jesus said he will not say to you anything of his own accord. He will only say to you what is in the heart of the Father. But one thing that we do know is the primary audience of the Holy Spirit is not just the individual, but it is the church. Because when John the Beloved was given an insight into the ministry of the Holy Spirit, he saw that the Holy Spirit was speaking unto the ecclesia, was speaking to the group. He says, let him who has an ear hear what the Spirit is saying unto the church. The word church, uh, like you know, was not the original word. The word church just means building. But the original word that was spoken by the Holy Spirit and inspired in John the Beloved was the word Ecclesia and so all through your Bible. It was the Catholic Church who replaced the word Ecclesia with church because of the deal that they had with King James in the 1600s. And we know the reason why they did that because they recognized that if people did not come to a particular building, it was not that easy to tax them. So the focus had to be on a building. So that you don't claim to be worshiping God in your own house and then receive a revelation that will set you free. You understand what I mean? Because they had learned that Martin Luther came up with the idea of neglecting the rituals of the Catholic Church because he went home and he studied the Bible on his own and he found that it is written therein that the just shall live by faith. And the Catholic Church did not want to repeat the mistake of encouraging one person to have a personal revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because when you have a personal revelation of Jesus Christ, then you become part of the company of those that Jesus is building up to oppress and to push back on the kingdom of darkness. Jesus says, I will build my ecclesia and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. When did he say that? He said that when he was talking to his disciples about the example of apostle Peter. When Peter did not speak, what was the consensus of opinion? You know, the Bible says that Jesus asked his disciples, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? He was asking them for the consensus of opinion. And people, some of the disciples who will remain forever nameless said, well, some say you're a prophet. Some say, you know the reason why they did not tell you their names because they wrote those epistles and they didn't want anybody to know that they were the ones who were in the flesh. 
You see what I mean? So that's why it was only Peter who was mentioned because he got a commendation. But in any case, story for another day. Some of them said, oh, some people say you're a prophet. Some people say you're a pastor. I mean, you're a teacher. Some people say that you're a prophet. In fact, some people have attempted to say that you are Elijah who has come from the dead. What, what, a, yeah, what a confusion. But Peter spoke and he says, you are Christ, son of the living God. Right? And Jesus says, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And upon this rock, which rock? The rock of revelation. I will build my church, my ecclesia, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So here it is. If we are going to be truly the army of the Lord Jesus, we have to be an army that comprises of individuals who can hear the voice of the good shepherd. We have to be able to, one on one, hear what God is saying to us. That is the only way by which we will be able to march in harmony with the rest of the band and be effective as an army that is ordained by the Lord of hosts himself. Does it make sense? And so when the word church was introduced to us, it was done so because the focus had to be taken away from the individual's relationship with the Heavenly Father by the ministry of the Holy Spirit to a collective gathering of supervision by men so that you're limited and restricted to religion deprived of relationship. Now what do we see? Majority of the billions of self-professing Christians in the world only pray when they come to a building. Several people do not dare to lift their hands to their heavenly fathers anymore in their wagons, in their closets. They only do so when they come to church because the pastor is watching and Chris is doing it. I might as well do the same. Systematically, over the period of 500 years, we have seen that which we're supposed to practice every day in our consciousness. We have seen it reduced to just a set of liturgical practices within four walls approved by the Episcopal. And that has become the detriment, or it's become very detrimental to the people of God. So we need to begin to wake up little by little. And we are, praise the Lord. We're waking up to recognize that, wait a minute, we are not called a building. The word church is from a, is from a primitive German word that just means a building. We are called Ecclesia. The word Ecclesia means the ones that have been called out. And that is exactly what we are in the sight of God. Those who have been called out from the world. The Bible says he has called us out of the darkness to show forth the praises of him. And so if we do not see ourselves as the Ecclesia and continue only to see ourselves as the church, then we are the exact opposite of what he wants us to be. We're supposed to be called out, not brought in. You understand what I mean? And so because when we are brought in, we want to comply. We want to be in conformity with what set of rules certain folks have laid down. But when we are called out, we are not trying to comply. We are trying to illuminate the world because we are the light of the world. And so when this was brought to my attention, it hit me really hard because of the fact that I noticed that many of us have become so obsessed with the darkness. The darkness is for the opposition. Light is what is for you. And apostle, I mean, the prophet Daniel says, when they say for a time will come that they will say there is a casting down, do not join them. You say that, that there is a lifting up. So we see that there is confusion in the world now wherein people not, no longer know a man from a woman. It was prophesied. The Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 1 that a spirit will go out into the world and it is called the reprobate mind. And this reprobate mind will cause for people to cease to know the value of a woman. You see how strategic the fulfillment of prophecy can be. You see, because the moment you remove that peace, everything else crumbles. Because the first woman was called Eve. Because she would be the mother of all living. And so the moment you go to the mother of all living, and then you switch up her identity, and delete the true definition of who she is, 
then every other distinction and dichotomy fades away and the entire world becomes once again without form and void. Let's read that Romans together because I want you to know that it's in your Bible. I want you to be able to read it to your children when you get home because what is going on in the world is not a political agenda. What is going on in the world is fulfillment of prophecy. And what is going on in the world is going on for your sake and mine. I thank God for what is going on in the world. You see, because you, I'm trying not to get ahead of myself here because I want to show to you what, I want to share with you what was shown to me. But first of all, let's look at Romans chapter one. And you know, one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible, can anybody guess? I have quoted this scripture sometimes more than I have said my own name. It is Romans chapter one, verse 20 that says from the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes have clearly been seen, being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power in Godhead so that they are without excuse. I'm just reading that because I can't get enough of that scripture. It's one of the most amazing things in the world that I can just look at the things that are made and then begin to have a better understanding of the one who made them. Once you understand that, the theory of evolution becomes just a fable that is apparent to you from a mile away. You understand what I mean? But let's go to verse 24. The Bible says, Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanliness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies amongst themselves. So we have teenagers now who are chopping off, teenage girls who are chopping off their mammary glands because they want to look like men. They are dishonoring their bodies. Why? Because God gave them up to those lusts. And so wait a minute. You're like, ooh, so the lusts have always been there. We just had too many policies, too many government restrictions that stopped people from expressing the lost. And so thank God that those government policies are crumbling because now we are seeing the darkness for what it is. Can I share that perspective with you again? Because some people are like, what have you just said? You know, over time, we have created a, a system of, of a system that disguises darkness. Because all of what is happening in the world today has always been. But we were kept from it so that we don't deal with it. If I can conceal the darkness from you, then there's no way your light can illuminate that darkness. And so the degradation and the decadence that we see in world government and world structure is not accidental. It is intended by heaven so that darkness can be exposed. So the lost has always been there. People have always been like that. But we were so babied because of the structures in place that kept us from seeing these things because Satan knew that if we had known of all of these things before now, while we were still very vibrant, we would have prayed. But most of us don't pray about what we do not know. Romans chapter 8 verse 26 lets us know that we do not know enough to even pray effectively. So the Bible says, verse 25, let me read verse 24 again because if you know anybody who is trying to change their natural form that they were birthed in, you may want to let them know that the Spirit of God does not lead anybody to do that. Only loss lead people to dishonor their own bodies. The Bible says in verse 25, who exchanged the truth. If I let some, let's keep reading from verse 20, because I think some of us need to be able to connect the dots. So I read 20 to you that everything is supposed to be clear to you as a believer so that you are without excuse from the visible elements you already know. So verse 21 says, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. The reason why I said I am thankful for what is happening in the world is if we are not thankful, darkness comes into our hearts. If we complain rather than give glory to God, what, do, what, do, what happens to us? If we complain rather than giving glory to God, we become futile in our thoughts and 
and our foolish hearts become darkened. And so that is the reason why before you complain, in fact, you should never complain. Whenever you're about to complain, ask yourself, what am I supposed to be thankful for? Because complaining always comes to announce a thing you should be grateful for. Every time the children of Israel complained in the wilderness, it was because they were staring at something in the face that they're supposed to be thankful for, but they allowed Satan's interpretation of reality to guide their expression to God. You see, if you let Satan do that, he will do that all day. It will skew your perspective. The children of Israel had just been delivered from the number one tyrant that human existence had seen since Nimrod. In fact, that particular administration of Pharaoh was an extension of the family of Nimrod. You can look at the history. But this time around, Nimrod's Babylon had gotten even stronger and more methodic. And so they were able to pull off what they pulled off in Egypt, which includes enslaving their own people. And so God had just delivered them and they're supposed to be thankful, but they kept complaining. They're supposed to be thankful for the fact that in the past, they did not even have an opportunity to be made separate from Egypt. But now they're separate from Egypt and all they want to do is complain about the fact that Pharaoh is running after them. And they're supposed to be thankful that they have gotten so ahead that Satan had to, I mean, Pharaoh had to be playing catch up. But no, they chose to complain. And so that's why I choose to say there is a lifting up because Daniel was explaining to us something that was revealed to him in the courts of heaven of the times that we're in. He saw the times that we're in. He saw darkness covering all of the earth. And he saw certain people were saying it's over from here, it's downhill. And he saw that those people, the more they complained, the weaker they became. That's why in Daniel 11, when he said, when they say there's a casting down, you say there is a lifting up. He said, because those who know their God will be strong and do exploits. If you know your God, you will give him glory. So the little nuances and strategies that the enemy uses to take away our prayer lives are the things that I am exposing to you today by the Holy Spirit. You cannot pray with the same mouth with which you have complained about what is going on. You cannot glorify God with the same mouth and fingers. This time around, for those of you making comments about all kinds of uh, posts online, and you're joining various groups to use your own human ability in the atmosphere, or I should say, upon the platform of consensus to fight darkness. The weapons of your warfare, they are not carnal, but mighty through God. So joining a political group or organizing a political resistance on Facebook is not going to overcome this darkness. This is a special kind of darkness. This darkness was the darkness from the beginning that God separated from the light. And the Bible says he called the, 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 the light day and the darkness, he called it night. He didn't call it evening. He called it night because it was not coming again until the end of the days. When does night come? Night comes at the end of the day. Evening is part of the day. And God said it. The Bible says so the evening and the morning were the first day. Evening is part of the day. But night isn't. Night comes at the end of the day. So the Bible says God separated. And that's why the Bible says for the night comes. Jesus was telling us that you saw that darkness that God sent packing at the beginning. God did not destroy it. He only sent it packing. But because everything goes around and comes around. Jesus was like I've seen that darkness. I was there. I know that that darkness darkness is coming and so be mindful for that darkness is coming and that darkness has now come and people are trying to fight the darkness with liturgy they're trying to fight the darkness with policy some people are even trying to fight the darkness by being emo emotionally aggravated do you know that when you get emotionally aggravated by what satan is doing you get recruited to his army why because the bible says to be carnally minded is enmity against God. And if Satan can get you to speak out in your flesh, even though you claim to be speaking against sin, but you cannot cast out demons by Beelzebub. 
Because the Bible says Jesus himself speaking. He says a kingdom divided against itself will not stand. So I cannot use anger and frustration and irritation to cast out iniquity. I cannot. We cannot. You see, that is the reason why we cannot afford to get agitated. We cannot afford to be in the flesh. You know, some of you, you see some sexual lifestyles that certain people seem to be walking in and then it gets you so aggravated and you become so irritated. You can't be irritated and walk in love at the same time because the Bible says that love is not irritable. First Corinthians chapter 13, speaking about the attributes of love. And so you're supposed to be resolute. You're supposed to be clear, but you're not supposed to be in the flesh. But those are the strategies of Satan. And how do they begin? Satan begins to get us to conform to the world by getting us to apply the weapons of the world. What does the world do? The world makes people feel bad. The world makes people feel degraded. Hoping that by so doing, they will recognize that, okay, maybe this is not a socially acceptable behavior. But that is not the gospel. And that is the reason why we're not seeing change. All we are seeing is more degradation. And so I wanted to say this and make it very clear, folks, that the weapons of our warfare are not supposed to be dictated by the world. There is no armor of Saul that can take down Goliath. We need to go back and think about it and submit ourselves to God. I'm pulling myself from a particular direction so that we can keep making progress. So here we are. Verse 23 says, and actually verse uh, 22, professing to be wise, they became fools. And changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds, and four-footed animals, and creeping things. A lot of what you've read here, maybe one day we're going to unpack it because a lot of these things are essentially a, a spelling out of the spirits that are behind a lot of world governments and particularly world economy. Those are the animals that have been mentioned in here, but story for another day, I just uh, wanted to say that in case you've already started thinking along those lines. Verse 24 says, Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanliness in the loss of their hearts, to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who, who, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever and ever. And so if you're wondering, um, if like me, you were exposed very early on to end time prophecies and end time expositions, you would have known that in the last days, the world will adopt one religion. So we're going to have a one world government, a one world economy, a one world money, and there's going to be a one world what? Religion. And what is that one world religion? It's not coexist. Okay, because I'm sure you know about the coexist movement, trying to harmonize everything. And it's not this triad of the Abrahamic religions, because you know there's a big push right now, uh, in fact, including a building that is being put up in Abu Dhabi to represent the three Abrahamic religions, Christianity, um, Islam, and Judaism. That's not what I'm talking about, because all those things are distractions, in case you're not aware. The true one world religion is exactly what is being spent the most money on, it is everywhere you turn, and it is called the worship of creation itself. They call it the green agenda. Okay, let me say this. I know some of us are a little bit political, so I want you to step out of politics for a moment and let us stop pure revelation. This is what the Bible says, that in the last days, everybody will, uh, people will adopt the religion of creation, worshiping creation, instead of worshiping the creator who is forever. What do they keep telling us about creation? They keep telling us that, oh, the earth is about to lose all its trees uh, because we're using too much fuel. Uh, we're polluting the air. We're producing too much of this, too much of that, methane and all of this stuff. In fact, the Bible says being wise, they became fools because as a true scientist, there is no sense in all of that nonsense. 
Okay? But that's because they want us to focus on worshiping creation. They want us to get to the point wherein every animal becomes too sacred for you to eat. Look at the, 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 the trap. They're telling us, well, we can't keep eating cows because cows produce a lot of greenhouse gases. But it's okay for us to eat insects. And the moment everybody starts eating insects, then they tell you, oh, we forgot insects are animals too. Yeah, because you know insects are animals too. You understand what I mean? They're not plants. You see what I mean? And so before you know what's going on, we will become worshippers of creation, but God forbid that we neglect the worship of the creator to worship creation. You see, the kingdom of Nimrod began with Erech and with Hakkad, which talks about subtlety. Satan is very subtle in its approach. Has always been, but then gotten better in the last days because the Bible says power was given to the dragon, that serpent of old, to deceive the nations. So I'm saying all of these things because when what was shown to me earlier was revealed to me, it hit me in such a way that I recognize that there are more of us who are still asleep than we can afford. We need to wake up. Jesus says, be sober and be vigilant. You see, because your adversary is going around in all subtlety trying to sneak up behind you. So if you have not been aware, you would join the campaign of the worship of creation, how we're going to preserve the forest, how we're going to preserve the animals. Oh, we cannot lift a finger. We can no longer farm. We can no longer do this because we're hurting nature. Oh my goodness, this nature was given to serve us, not us to serve it. Because if we do not first of all recognize that, then there is no way we can glorify God in the way that we relate to creation. When the Pharisees came to Jesus to accuse the disciples to Jesus, which was one of the ways by which they told everybody that they were working for Satan, because Satan is the accuser of the brethren. So if anybody is in your midst, those people watching online, because our communion house, we don't have none of those people, praise God. But if you have people in your midst who are always accusing one brother or sister, every time they come, they come with an accusation about somebody who is not doing things right, somebody who they don't believe in, then you immediately just know to put that person out because they are of the devil. Satan is the accuser of the brethren. If you look at the apostles, they always use one word. They will say, we'll commend you to the glory of God. People who are of God will commend you. Even if there is work to be done in you, they commend the progress that you have made rather than point out the gap that is still between you and where you need to be. And so the Pharisees came as the accusers of the brethren. They came and said, oh, look at your disciples. They're working on the Sabbath. What did Jesus say to them? Jesus said, and so what? He says, do you not know that the Sabbath was made for man instead of man for the Sabbath? The tree was made for man, not man for the tree. The cow was made for man. And God says of all the green trees, again, the, God was the first person to point out the fact that trees are green. Not the United Nations. Jesus says of all the green herbs I have given you, you can eat. And then again, he added to the portfolio. He says, now you can even eat animals too. Thank God for Noah, because God didn't tell Adam to eat animals. He told him to eat herbs. But when Noah came along, God was like, okay, y'all can eat meat now too. I mean, it was kind of like a compensation after all the gory experience of the flood. And that's my opinion. I think it was a way of saying, okay, 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 I'm going to give you something, you know, just to make up for all your hard times. Now you can eat animals. Because, and this is my theory, okay? If God had told Adam that he could eat animals, when all those animals were on the ark, Noah may have, he may have sent some of them into early extinction by giving himself, yeah, because let's think about it, up until Noah, people didn't really eat animals. The ones who ate animals were the descendants of Cain who sold out to, uh, to the devil. You see, there was an agent of Satan who came, and you won't find this in the 66 books that the Catholic Church were so kind enough to let you have. But if you read other scriptures that the apostles read, you will see that there was an agency of Satan who taught men certain kinds of music 
that the moment they started to play that music, all manners of lust would start to arise within them, the lust for strange flesh. It was the music that caused them to start sleeping with animals. It was the music that caused men to sleep with men. It was the music that also caused men to start to eat things that God said not to eat, just the music. If you read the Chronicles of Adam and Eve, you will understand what I am saying. So, so that's, but they took those things out because they wanted to use the same music to control our lives today. Because if you had read that, then you would not fall for a lot of the things that you're falling for. Praise God. I'm glad for the people who raised me in ministry because when they raised us in ministry, they told us those things. They told us that the music is as powerful a tool for worshiping God as it is a tool for rebelling against God. And so if you listen to the wrong music, that's why the Bible says very clearly that whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there's any virtue, if there's any praise, upon these things, meditate. You see, and so if someone is always singing about heartbreaks, do not meditate. If they keep singing about violence, do not meditate. If they keep singing about materialism, do not meditate. If they keep singing about how they feel when they're in ecstasy after using drugs that are not good for the human being, do not meditate simply because that kind of music will take you away from God. One of these days, I think we should get into it and just talk about I mean, I'm trying to remember the name of that spirit. There's a spirit that came in and he acted through one of the descendants of Cain. And the guy became very skillful in music and he led the first rebellion, a collective rebellion against God. There were individual rebellions against God up until that time, but that was the guy. And now everything that you saw was packaged into a community that was championed by Nimrod after the flood because they wanted to preserve that ungodliness. Anyway, let's go back to this um, Romans chapter one. And and I'm going to speed up from here, so help me God. Verse 26 says, For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. And that has so many meanings. Women no longer use that which is natural. Hmm. Let's, uh, that's self-explanatory. So verse 27 says, Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men, committing that which is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of the error which was due. So when I tell somebody that being a man, for, for a man to be with a man sexually is a shameful thing, it's not my opinion, it is the word of God. You understand what I mean? But then, don't just quote that part of the word of God to put people down. That's what the word of God says. Quote the beginning part of it, which lets everybody know who is really responsible. It is not the man who is sleeping with the man that is the problem, but it's the prince of this world who blinded their eyes that is the culprit. We need to recognize that the foundation behind every manifestation is a spirit being or a spiritual authority. And that's why the Bible says God gave them to a reprobate mind, a debased mind, and that is the reason why all these things are happening. They're not happening just because people were born that way. They were happening because of the fact that Satan overran some people and caused them to choose shame over glory. So that when we pray, we know how to pray. It is the prince of this world that blinded their eyes. But Satan wants us to be fighting in the flesh. He wants us to choose hate and irritability over love kindness, compassion, and above all, in these days, intercession. When I say above all, the reason why I say that is because this is the most faint-hearted we have been as a group of people. Many Christians or believers are very faint-hearted today. They're just like, what's the point? There's no hope. These world is going to hell in a hand basket. But it is when you see that. Luke 17, Jesus spoke about the end. He told us all the signs of the end, including the earthquakes, right? Specific earthquakes, and I'm going to talk about them in a minute because we need to be on red alert right now. When he spoke about those things in Luke 17, he followed it up with Luke chapter 18, verse 1. 
He says men ought always to pray and not faint. So when you see all these things in the news, they make you feel faint-hearted. When you see how politicians have become corrupt and government institutions that used to be very dignifying have now become stages for the reprobate mind to play. You, you feel bad. I mean, the, the, it's, it's a human reaction for us to just feel like it's over. But the Bible says that is when you need to pray. God, that was God's alarm system for you to know when to kick in to perpetual intercession. And so we should be thankful that God did not leave us comfortless. He has not left us without clues. So at every point in time, we know what to do. That's why the Bible says that we are without excuse. Romans chapter 1 verse 20 that we just read. We are without excuse because everything is very apparent. Now, before we read Joel chapter 2, let me quickly tell you a little bit about a picture that was brought to me in the early hours of today. In the early hours of today, I saw a bottle that was being emptied out. And the moment I saw the bottle that was being emptied out, I knew that was the hand of God. I knew this isn't just, this isn't just any bottle. This is the hand of God. And so I paid close attention. And it was said to me, young man, it's time for you to ask questions. Now, just to help you out, some of the ways by which heaven operates is such that heaven would allow for you to express a need for a thing before giving it to you so that you are not inundated with things that you're not ready for. That's why the Bible says he knows who follow to know. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, blessed are the ones who hunger and thirst for they shall be filled. God has enough to fill everybody, but he's not just going to fill everybody because he doesn't want people to complain to say, God, why are you blessing me so much? I don't want it. That revelation that you've just given to me, I don't like it. I'm not going to use it. Because God expects you not to cast your pearl before swine because he doesn't do that. He doesn't waste heaven's resources. So he waits for you to quest for things. Now, that is different from what I was saying last week when I said God will give you things that you haven't asked for because the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom and its righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. I'm talking about people who are already seeking who will now receive exceedingly abundantly above what they're asking for. You understand what I mean? But when it comes to getting started, you need to ask. And so it was said to me by the angel of the Lord, young man, ask questions. And I'm like, okay. First of all, I want to confirm, what is the bottle? And he told me the bottle is the world. I said, oh, that makes sense. Because the world is now full of corruption. When Jesus was asked when he was coming back, he says, I'm not coming back until the cup of wickedness is full. Because God does not want anyone to have an excuse. So God allows everybody to bring out all of the loss that is in their hearts so that it's free game. If we use policy to keep people from expressing their true sexuality, then that is not the glory of God. That is the power of man restricting people from truly living out what's inside of them. And so when the creator comes to judge the world, people will say, well, I wish I had lived my life differently, if not for this lame government policy. Okay, let's remove the government policies and let people truly live out what is in them that we may see how far darkness has gone with people. It is for our sakes because if this darkness does not come the way it has come, then no one's going to see your light. Isaiah says in the last days darkness will cover the earth and gross darkness the people. He says, but then also in the same last days you will rise and you will shine because your light is come and the knowledge of the glory of God shall fill the earth. I am thankful for the way things are in the world. I have stopped complaining because I recognize that why am I complaining about what is working for me? Because I want Jesus to come because every human government has failed, which is great because now when Jesus' government comes, we will appreciate it very greatly because it is what we have always needed that we didn't want to admit. And so at the end of the day, one of the things that we see is that all these things are happening for your sake, for your sake and mine. Let this world be full of corruption quickly so that the Lord can come to establish his administration. And so I saw the bottle, the bottle was full and it was turned upside down. And it was told to me that for a bottle to be emptied, two things have to happen. It has to be turned upside down, first of all. And that is the reason why the world is now upside down. 
Do you know that the people that are most believable today are the ones who tell the most lies? You tell somebody the reality of what the word of God is saying and they're like, but that's not what's in the news. I'm like, what news? What news? Let me tell you something. People have come to believe the ones who are telling the most. Do you know that people believe politicians now more than they believe the prophets? Oh, that's not what the congressman said. Okay. But by their fruits, we shall know them. When my brother Stefan came up, he said, I may not have known you too much, but I know Alan, and by the fruits that you have born in his life, I know you. You understand what I mean? So why would I just listen to the dust coming out of people's holes when I've already seen the fruits that they bear? And I'm like, if you continue to bear fruits of immorality, then there cannot be any truth in you because Jesus says, only good trees bear good fruits. So if you're bearing bad fruits, then you're a bad tree. And you are of the order of your father, the devil. You understand what I mean? But that's because the world is upside down. The people who sell the most stuff today are the ones who produce the least stuff. In fact, if you want to sell a lot, produce nothing. Back in the day, the people who sold the most are the ones who produced the most. But now we live in a post-industrial world wherein the ones who actually have the most money in their economy are the ones who produce the least goods in their same economy. Because the world is upside down. The world is upside down because now if you come out and you speak the truth against immorality, people will call you all kinds of names because the world is upside down. So now the world approves of everything that God disapproves of. We can fill this place up next week by just making changes to some of our posts. We can just begin to say that, oh, you know, when Jesus said this, he didn't really mean that. You know, because, I mean, you can have male and female when there's only a few million people on earth. But now that we have billions, I think we need to diversify. And before you know what's going on, everyone's going to come. Because the Bible says in the last days, men will develop itching ears and they will gravitate only toward what tickles their fancy. The Bible says they will heap up for themselves teachers who say what they want to hear. We've had several people come through these doors who left because we're saying things that they do not want to hear. I've had people say to me that, you know what, people will be more encouraged to attend if I would just let them know my political position, that people these days don't just want to be on that pastor whose political affiliations they do not know. And I'm like, that is according to Luke chapter what? <laughs> and they're like, no, 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 no. Someone said to me once, oh, Pastor Moses, everything can't be the Bible. No, everything is the word of God because man shall not live by bread alone, but by everything. Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. If you cannot substantiate what you're saying by revelation from God, I do not answer to you. I answer only to the word. It doesn't matter if it's popular or not. I'm not going to promote any candidate because I, I have only one candidate and he is the Lord Jesus. You understand what I mean? And so, I mean, at the end of the day, it is what it is. You choose to stay upright in an upside down world is not very easy. Try that in a swimming pool. Yeah. It's very, it's very challenging, but we have to because we have to be upright to behold the light. And so when I saw the bottle, they told me two things are required. The bottle has to be turned upside down. I said, okay. But when I saw the bottle turned upside down, I noticed something. I noticed that some of the fluid bubbled to the top. And I'm like, I see what's in the top of this empty bottle and it is emptiness. And that's what we see in the world today. The ones who are on top, supposedly in the world, are some of the emptiest people. They're so empty, sometimes they don't even know their own names. They're so empty, they forgot what they said last summer. They're so empty, they forgot what they wrote in the book that they published. Simply because it is by design for this bottle to be turned upside down because God wants to empty out the immorality. And the angel of the Lord said to me, you know what comes next. I said, absolutely. 
Once you turn a bottle down, upside down that you want to empty, you begin to shake it. And the Lord said to me, there is a shaking that is coming. The Lord is shaking out the bubbles, the emptiness, the impure content of this earth that he made for his praise. And that was what I was telling you about the earthquakes. Jesus says the earthquakes in the natural are only giving you an indication of what is going, in, going on in the spirit. So brace up, ladies and gentlemen, and be ready to lift up your hands in praise when you see these things because they're not supposed to make your heart faint. The flood is coming, but it's not to sink you, it's to raise you. So Joel chapter 2 verse 17, and now we're going to break bread. Praise the Lord. Joel chapter 2 verse 17. And we're just going to look at a couple of things and then go ahead to break bread. If you are new, I want to say welcome to Communion House. Thanks for coming out uh, today, this Father's Day at Communion House. We encourage everybody to take the communion um, regardless of your lifestyle, regardless of how well you're doing or how badly you're doing. Because I know that uh, many people have said, oh, you have to be worthy of the Lord's body. The Bible didn't say that. The Bible says some people partook of the Lord's body unworthily and the apostle was talking about those people who turned the communion to a feast. They made it about themselves instead of being about the Lord. And the Bible says some of them have suffered illnesses even in their own bodies, some unto death. And that is the reason why some people are afraid to take the communion because they told the lie on their way to church. They're afraid to take the communion because they know that God's been speaking to them to repent from dead works, but they have refused. Here we encourage everybody to take the blood because there is no cleansing without the blood. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. This is the one thing that has no requirement. You see, because if there's a requirement to salvation, none of us would be able to make it. And that is the reason why the Bible calls it a free gift of God, which is eternal life. So I want to encourage you today, regardless of where you're at, where you're at with God and with your friends, take the communion today as Jesus commanded. He says, do this in remembrance of me. Remind yourself that your sins are forgiven. Remind yourself that Jesus paid the price. Remind yourself that it is of his fullness that you have received. Remind yourself that you cannot save yourself, but he has saved you. So you take it with a heart of gratitude, knowing fully well that in your weakness, his strength is made perfect. So Joel chapter 2, I had it open earlier. Yeah, here we are. Hannah, good to see you. It's been a minute. God bless you. And Shayla, thank you for inviting your dad to this Father's Day. We appreciate your presence here, sir. Thanks for coming out. God is good. Joel chapter 2, verse 17. The Bible says, let the, priest who, let the priests who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not give your heritage to reproach that the nations should rule over them. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? I'm, I'm here to encourage you today that it is not a bad thing for people to say, where is your God? You see, because the further people go into oppression, the more absent they think God is. The children of Israel were no longer confident to speak of their God because which God are you talking about that's allowed you to be subservient to Pharaoh these many hundred years? You know, after a while, the lack of result makes us feel like we can't really make a boast in the Lord. Because the same people that you've been talking to for a couple of years, you know, oh, the God is good. You keep prophesying, you keep confessing the promises of God, and they look at your life and they see that, okay, all these things that you're saying, we haven't seen them. And then after a while, that makes many of us to retract from being confident in God. Because other people are asking, where is your God? And it has been brought to my attention that the reality of it is that when people begin to wonder where uh, God is, 
is actually when our God begins to make his appearance because he is an invisible God. And so when they don't see him, then that means he's there. When they see a semblance of what looks like God, it might be one that is made by the hands of men. And I say that because of what is happening in this nation that we are also seeing across the world. There was a time when we felt like, oh, we were in a Christian nation. We felt a lot of Christian things happening around us. And it has now turned out to be a lot of that which we call Christian was just man-made. So it is not doom and gloom when people ask, where is your God? No, it is part of the process of God's hand Getting prepared to move on the behalf of his people. And I'm going to tell you why. What we just read is this. The Bible says it is time for the priest to stand between the porch and the altar and begin to intercede. Because when God is coming, he wants his people to be alert. Intercession is what it means to be a watchman. Jesus says, watch and pray. We're not interceding because we have no hope. We're not interceding because we feel despondent. We're not interceding because we feel like everything is against us. We're interceding because we know that the world is wondering where our God is and he's about to show up. And so our intercession is our way of receiving him into our realm. It's our way of announcing to him that we know that he is about to appear. Our intercession is a way of knowing fully well, of saying that we know fully well that our Redeemer lives. And we have been called who are ministers and priests of our Heavenly Father to intercede, to lift up our voices and wail. So I want to encourage you today that if you have neglected the art of intercession, pick it up again because the intercessors will be the first to see Jesus. The watchman will be the first to see Jehu, the son of Nimshi. That's what the Bible says. The intercessors will be the first, the watchmen upon the tower. Someone says, I don't care to be the first as long as I see him. Well, it is not the goal to be the first to see him. It is just a reward. So if you're saying, oh, I don't care about being the first, as long as I see him eventually, be careful what you ask for because some people, just by choosing too little, they get nothing. You do not want to be asleep when he comes because the Bible says when he comes, those who are asleep, he will come upon them as a thief in the night. And you are not supposed to be one of those people. You're supposed to be aware of your season. There should be oil in your lamp. And what is the oil in your lamp? It, intercession. Intercession is what allows for you to see clearly in the midst of the darkness. Because when you intercede, you begin to hear what God is saying. When you intercede, you begin to experience and enjoy the ministry of angels. I bring you once again to what I started with, talking about the ministry of angels. I know that God has given his Holy Spirit who speaks to the ecclesia, but the angels are there on assignment to interpret the message to you as an individual, to open the scroll that has your name on it so that you see very clearly what your marching orders are. We need all of the arsenal that heaven's made available to us, the ministry of the Holy Spirit as well as the ministry of angels. And so when the angels are saying that it is time for a shaking, that the world has been turned upside down so that you can truly be seen as an upright standing saint, what do you do with all that privilege? Begin with intercession. Pray so that you are not swept away. And lastly, we're just going to read one scripture from Jeremiah chapter 19. Just one verse of scripture, Jeremiah chapter 19, verse 1. And with that, I commit you to the coming week and to the heart of intercession. The Bible says, thus says the Lord. Go and get a potter's earthen flask and take some of the elders of the people and some of the elders of the priests. There are two types of elders that are mentioned here. The elders of the people and the elders of the priests. As we go into this week, I want you to pray a prayer of thanksgiving in your closet before the Lord. Giving thanks to God for these two groups of people. They still exist. They are not the ones in the news, but they are somewhere. Give God thanks because the people, especially the ecclesia, 
we still have elders who have not sold their birthright to mammon. We still have elders in the body of Christ who have not given up their call because of money. We still have people who have not bent the knee to bear just because of bread. Thank God for those elders. They're not very many, but they exist. And then also give God thanks for the priests. Some of the things that I've been seeking the Lord concerning, especially this last week, is Lord, vindicate your anointed ones. There are some of us who have chosen to take the high road and to live sacrificial lives, who have chosen not to, not to dilute the integrity of the world, of the word of God, because the world is promising us a building. We have chosen not to compromise our stance in Christ Jesus because of a book deal. And the Lord is now saying to me, this is the Lord's response to my quest because I'm Lord, vindicate your righteous ones. On one of those days wherein my heart was aggrieved within me, the Lord raised my wife to minister to me. She walked by and she knew that I was not myself and she said, the Lord will vindicate you. And so pray for the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord for the elders of the people and give God thanks for the elders amongst the priests who have not bent the knee to bear. And if you're wondering why this is important, it is important to many levels, but I tell you two of them very quickly. Because some of you, God has a place for you on the table of the elders, but if you don't appreciate and cherish the ones there, you will not get there. And that's number one. And number two is some, somewhat mundane, but also very important. There are tired elders. There are elders whose arms are weak. But when you begin to give God thanks for them, he sends them the helpers that will lift up their hands. Simply because those elders, their hands have to be up for us to keep winning. If the hands of the elders are down, I'm not preaching the glorification of men. You know me. If the best of men at the very best are still men. We are brothers and sisters. We are all men under God. But I say that because there are offices that have been cut out by God for the perfecting of the saints and for the edifying of the body. Lift up the elders by lifting up praise to God for their sake. So let's go ahead and receive the Lord's body and drink of his blood in remembrance of him. There is an awakening in the hearts of men. This Father's Day, Father, we thank you for the ones who are fathers amongst us. We thank you for the elders amongst us. Even though the world just wants us to celebrate fathers, yes, we celebrate fathers, but we celebrate the generality of elders, male and female. We celebrate the ones that you have appointed elders, who, the ones, oh, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God is good. When we give God thanks, he gives us more. The moment I said, thank you, Lord, for the elders, I was about to say for you, I've given them so much patience. The Lord has, has allowed for the elders amongst us to be schooled in patience. And as soon as I said that, I see that patience is being poured out on all. If you are struggling with waiting on the Lord, your patience has run dry. You feel like you're not patient with God. You're not patient with spouse. You're not patient with children. You're not patient with others. As you are here today to hear this prophecy, I pray that the very portion of this prophecy that is yours for a lifting will not miss your head. That you will come under the oil of the anointing of this outpouring of the patience of the fruit of the spirit that you will begin to see yourself being patient with God, with self and with others in the mighty name of Jesus. So Father, we receive this patience. Lord, we will patiently wait upon you. We will patiently wait to see Christ formed in others. We will not complain, we will give thanks. We will not be discouraged, we will intercede. Father, we thank you for this patience that has come to refresh, to renew and to strengthen. And Lord, we thank you for the generality of the elders as they continue to hold the fort, they will not retire ahead of their time, neither will they fall off the watchtower, but they will stand and continue to wail as the ministers that announce the entry of the invisible God are about to be made visible in the blue skies. Father, we give you praise because our redemption is nearer now than when we first believed. I want to pray for somebody who is unable to shake off the consciousness of lack. You have been so lack conscious lately. You think constantly about what you lack 
and it doesn't allow for you to think about what you have in Christ Jesus. I pray for you today. In fact, I pray, let, let every one of us lay our hands upon our heads. Every single one of us. Let us just ask for a reconditioning of our minds in the Holy Ghost. That we will focus on things that are above and not things that are beneath. Lack is beneath you. Abundance is what is above you. Let your eyes be lifted up. Stop looking down. It is not who you are. Look up and receive. Look up and become. Look up. You have more than you can ever imagine. Your heavenly father has given to you everything that pertains to life and godliness. Look up and see who you are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Lastly, very quickly, I want you to come up here. If this applies to you, I want to pray with you very quickly. And I know that I've closed my Bible, but this altar call is from Romans chapter 12, verse 9. And um, I just want a few people to come out very quickly just to lay my hands upon you. Um, Alan mentioned something earlier on while he was praying. In fact, I thought my wife was going to be praying also because it was one of the things that I saw. But this is the way the Lord is taking care of it. Romans chapter 12, verse 9. We are moving to another level. There are certain of us that there, is, there are levels almost let me describe what I see. See, the level where you're at, there are rooms that you haven't accessed. But you're already seeing the next level, but the Lord is saying you're leaving certain things behind. You're not, you haven't completed this level. And the Lord wants you to complete the level very quickly so that you can move up. So look at what the Bible says in Romans chapter 12, verse 9. And if, if that applies to you the way that I am saying it, I want you to come up very quickly. The Bible says, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. The Bible says what? That love, let it be without hypocrisy. The reason why before God you have not completed this level is because you have exempted some people from your love. And I'm not, don't feel bad if it applies to you. You had your reasons. You made certain conclusions for self-preservation. But the, because the Lord sees your heart is come to you in his mercy today, saying to you that some of those people, the rooms that they're in, hold treasures for you. There are medals that you need to receive in those rooms. Go after those people and you will find what God has for you. But I want to pray for you. I want you to come out if you feel like certain people have been excluded, certain places have been excluded. It happens. Don't feel bad. Just come forth. I want to lay my hands on you real quick because there was a time that that was me. I was, at, I was in that place. I shot certain people out many years ago. And the Lord said to me, no, that I need to go after them. Because I can't just pick and choose. My love has to be without hypocrisy. I need to cling to that which is good. And, 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 and there is good in there. Even though I'm trying to avoid the evil or what I think is evil. And by so doing, I miss the good. No, there is good in there and God wants you to pursue those things in righteousness. So I want you to come. Father, I'm in the mighty name of Jesus. Just give me your hand. Lord, in Jesus' name, I thank you. Because this man will break barriers. This man will undo barriers that have kept him from places and from people that you would have him touch with your love in the mighty name of Jesus. As you go forth, Kenyatta, the fire of God goes before you to consume anything that could potentially harm you. So you don't have to worry about self-preservation. You don't have to worry about somebody hurting your feelings or turning down your love. Just go. You will not be hurt you will come out victorious in the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for this man of God. I thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name for certain conclusions that came about because of his assessment of people. I've been undone right now because you are opening his eyes for him to see the good that is in those people and in those places in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, I give you praise because forgiveness is by authority. Jesus says, I have given you the authority to forgive sins. Whoever you forgive is forgiven. They don't deserve it. You don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. But he gave it to us anyway. So extend that forgiveness as undeserved as they may be. And that is what makes it an extension of the grace of God in the mighty name of Jesus. The authority to forgive. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. I know they asked for it, Shayla. They asked for it. They asked for the treatment that they have gotten. They asked for the seclusion that they have received. But now the Lord is asking for you to go. As you go across... You will not return the same. You will be blessed with the blessings of deep beneath and the blessings that are coming from up above. 
in the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let love be without hypocrisy. Who's next? In the mighty name of Jesus. I know you were waiting. Yeah, that's because I saw something else. I just didn't say it. You simply just need to ask. You don't have to strategize. You don't have to come up with a plan. Just ask and say, Lord, lead the way. And he will lead the way. He will put words in your mouth. He will tell you what you must say. You understand what I mean? Just ask. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, glory be to God in the highest. Hallelujah. They long for your love. Take it to them. Oh yeah, forget about their faces. Their faces are telling a lie. Their hearts are longing for your love. In the mighty name of Jesus, the Lord will grant unto you peace for the battles that you have fought. What I heard was for every war, you will have peace in the mighty name of Jesus. So go forth in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth into singing. Even those ones who are as rigid as trees, the Bible says they will clap their hands. Your sacrifice will be applauded in this season in the mighty name of Jesus. You're ready to spring forth to the next. Let me tell you something. I want you to look at me. What I saw that the Lord revealed to me is you kept saying, I don't believe why people would do that. I just can't believe this. I just can't believe that. It is what people do. You see what I mean? But loving is what you do because you are your heavenly father's child. Your disappointment stems from just, unbel just pure disappointment. Like how would people do that? But the Lord is saying, you do not do what they do. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And as you have chosen in your heart, oh, praise the Lord. You see what I saw, woman of God was, I saw you just kind of like wearing inner clothes. And then as soon as you stepped forward, the Lord put his robe upon you. So as you step forward, he empowers you, not just with a tunic, but a cloak with which you go out in joy. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Your blessings have been released as you go forth in the mighty name of Jesus. God bless you. I commend you to the grace of God and to the manifold wisdom of the one who loves you and gave himself for you. As you give yourself to others sacrificially. Where's your brother? Where's your husband? Look, you're tapping into that grace too. You understand what I mean? You should be here, but it's okay because she's here for both of y'all. You're tapping into that grace also. Your strength is been renewed in the mighty name of Jesus. You may leave, woman of God. Father, when Jesus name, I thank you. You see, this, the, the B part of that scripture is what's for you. Cling unto that which is good. Abhor that which is evil. I pray for your spirit discernment, your inner selector to become sharp. You see, your inner selector will be sharpened so that you can resist the evil without, so basically not throwing out the baby with the bath water, the, the baby with the bath water. Being able to resist the evil that is in people while embracing the good that God has put inside of them. You see, and you know what that's going to do? It's going to create a turnaround in the lives of the ones that you approach. What the Lord revealed to me were two magnets. You know, when you have two magnets and, and the North Pole and the, South, and the two North Poles face each other, what happens is it flips around. One of them will flip around so that they can attract. That was what I saw. I saw people flipping around because your discernment resists the evil in them. It flips to the other side. You're able to cling to that which is good and together you see darkness illuminated in the lives of people. And the Lord says, do not be afraid to say that which I put on your lip. The, that which I put in your heart to say. Don't be afraid. When you hear it coming out of you, you may want to pull back and say, oh, am I really saying that? The Lord says, no, just let it go. Let it flow. And that is how there will be salvation and deliverance in the mighty name of Jesus. Peace reigns in your relationships in the mighty name of Jesus. I want you to go this way. So everybody, when you come in this way, please go that way. Jesus is Lord. I want you to say that with me. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. The reason why you have had a problem with them is because they have not fully submitted to Jesus. Jesus is Lord. And the more they recognize that Jesus is Lord, the more they will be able to receive your love. They have resisted your love because they have resisted his love. But as you have chosen to go to those rooms regardless and to those places notwithstanding, the Lord is with you. He's gone ahead of you and you will return with captives. Yes, you will make them captive to the love of God. You're bringing them into submission to the love of your heavenly father in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. The Lord will give you a man that is your next level. But for where you're right now, you need to close those chapters. There is a book that you need to put away 
Just close it and put it away. Don't throw it away. You know, don't throw it away like I'm, you're angry or, or disappointed or frustrated or, or hurt. No, just close it and just put it where it needs to be. There is a place for that book too. And as you do that in the wisdom of God, it will bring to you a new chapter of fulfillment. You see, a book so big that there is room for you. I see you walking in the pages of the book. It is big enough for you to accommodate you, not just tolerate you, but to celebrate you. Kelu lakims, likum shia lakims. I see from the pages of the book, you have been illuminated and you become a radiant. But to get there, you need to close this other book and put it away. Don't throw it out. Don't be angry. Be thankful. In Jesus' name, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Arise and shine, for your light is come. Did I not say to you, says the Lord, a little while ago, that you're about to be seen by those who have passed by? Did I not say to you, this is how you will be seen. Your light will shine and the glory of the Lord will be, risen, will be seen upon you. Let me tell you something. You're about to experience what will seem like a change in personality. But you are still who you are. It's just that your fruitful season has come. And some will say, wow, it's like, is that really you? It is really you. It's just that now, you as a tree with fruits, not just leaves. Bear fruits in this season. And don't forget, as the Lord has said to you, he's about to inspire within you songs. Even though you forget, he doesn't. Because that is his will for you in Christ Jesus. Sing unto the Lord a new song. God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Stephan. Father, we thank you. The Lord is allowing for you to spread your seed. And what I mean by your seed refers to your personal revelation of the word of God. That which the Lord has revealed unto you that you have experienced, that has become flesh to you. The Lord is giving you opportunity in this next season to spread it. I see you just with a fertile ground and you're just putting seed here and putting seed there. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, thank you. You see, but there is a reason in this season for you to just wave to the ones that you are leaving behind. I see you shutting the door behind you and waving. Yes, it, there is a reason in this season for you to wave, for people to know that you are moving on and you are moving forward because that is what will inspire some of them to take a leap of faith into the destiny that God has for them. You need to wave. They have to see you leave. They have to see you as you shut that door behind you. They have to see you leave. And I say that because I see you just like, even what you're wearing now is what you were wearing as I saw you. The shirt, but just a different pant. And so I know that it's got to do with what connects this season to the next. And as you do that to honor your heavenly father, you see that ground that is already prepared for you to put the seed of revelation and instruction into, you will get there and you will do the will of your heavenly father in Jesus name. Amen. Praise the Lord. God is good. Alrighty. Thank you so much everybody for such a glorious father's day. I appreciate the men once again. Thank you women. Thank you everybody. I'm going to just hand you over to a man of God, Alan, who's going to come to receive the offerings with a word of blessing and to give us some announcements. You may eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood in Jesus name. Amen. Thank you, diamond. She spoke without speaking. Oh. Hey, Maramando Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There are seven blessings for your attention. I'm going to show you three of them real quick. But please find the four. Revelations 21. The way Diamond reminded me that we have not broken bread was the way that I, reminded, I was reminded that we haven't given out all the gifts. There are presents being handed out. I see it. 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 Like party bags that were being given out because you came. And when I pressed in, I was like, man, there are seven blessings. In Revelation 21, I'll show you three of them very quickly. You can get the rest on your own when you get home. Oh, yes. So take, take these for your party bags for Father's Day. Revelation chapter 21 verse 3. The Bible says, Then I heard a loud voice from heaven. It is a there is a blessing called the blessing of audibility. God wants to bless you with his audible voice in this season. Blessing number one. The next one is in verse 5. Then he said, Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I will make all things new. 
There is a blessing of newness coming in this season. There's another one in there, but let's quickly go to verse 7 and 8. Verse 7 and 8, the Bible says, He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. There is a blessing that is called the blessing of eternal life that allows for you not to have fear of judgment, but gives you comfort confidence in vindication because he has justified you. You see, many people are afraid of this and they do not even know, but you have justification and it is a blessing that gives you joy. So praise the Lord. God is good. Hallelujah. Come on, let's celebrate the Lord. God is good. As my dear sister Hannah prepares the offering slide, I want to welcome our dear brother Chris to receive the offering. Come on. <laughs> Hallelujah. What an on-time word. Amen. This is indeed fertile ground. Amen. And if, if you don't feel spiritually fed after that, we got to talk after service. Uh, God is good. If you direct yourselves to the screens, um, we've got... Uh, the Cash App details and Zelle details for the tithes and offerings. And um, I just want to bring those to the storehouse. So those who are watching online, uh, you've got the information there. Um, just want to also just say I'm so grateful to be here uh, on this Saturday uh, with all of you. And um, definitely want to uh, just be thankful for, for the word that we got fed today. Um, and I just want to also uh, just pray. So if everybody bow their heads and close their eyes, Father God, we come to you today as humbly as we know. We just thank you for the fertile ground you planted here. Um, and we just ask that you to just bless these tithes and offerings because you know our hearts, Lord. And we just ask that you continue to pull us near to you and allow your Holy Spirit to resonate with us and just provide us with that spirit of discernment. Allow us to make it to our, our destinations back safely to home and Father, we just thank you, and we just love you, and we're forever grateful. In the mighty name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. God is good. God is good. Thank you so much, Brother Chris, for receiving the offerings. We are going to close here, but I want to share just a couple of announcements. We're wrapping up this Father's Day month strong. Uh, my dear sister Hannah, if you'll help us with the June 25th. You'll see that slide there. We got something special in store. Men's golf. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Celebrate. Let's celebrate. And come on now, here in the spirit. The slide will be up there in just a bit. June 25th, all right, 9 a.m. Our dear brother Chris has coordinated this time for us. We'll be at... Panola Mountain. Panola Mountain Golf Course. Uh, first come, first serve there. So we want to get there at a good time to just go. And if you don't know how to play, that is okay. We're going to go hit some balls. We're going to play like Tiger, as my, my granny would say. Um, and, and just have a great time of fellowship. Since I have been here at Communion House, this, this is one of our first um, uh, kind of sporting Events you see where we're, we're actually going to play, and not only this, I'm gonna uh, uh, just bombard us with the announcements here. We have another one on July 8th, so we're, we're extending this Father's Day month. If you'll hit us with the next slide, please, Hannah. Men's basketball, come on, somebody. I don't know if we got any hoopers in the building, but that's okay. If, you, if you've never played or you, you're not that good, we're going to come and hoop. Our dear brother John has coordinated this, him and his father. They have a, a beautiful facility that they'll welcome us to as men to just come and hoop and just fellowship that way. Uh, I'm sure we may chop it up after and get some, get some food after uh, burning those calories. But I want you to put these two items on your calendar because we're excited to just go iron sharpening iron and fellowship. And you see God. God is good. We have to take up or make the most of these opportunities that the Lord has presented to us. Amen. Amen. God is good. Father, we give you praise for this time of fellowship and this time of encountering you yet again. We thank you for this presence, for the words that you have ministered unto us, that you have made plain, that we may run with it. All glory and honor belong to you. And we all said, amen. amen.
Hallelujah. Now, as we wrap up, we have gifts here for the fellas here, for our fathers. So as you're making your way out, come be presented with the token of appreciation. And we just want to love on you that way. All right. Everyone have a blessed night.